we're back into our series on the parables and today we're going to talk about the parable of the workers in the vineyard or laborers in the vineyard so if you have your bibles with you then uh, please turn with me to matthew chapter 20 um it's going to be the first 16 verses of that chapter it'll be on the screen as well so matthew 20 starting at verse 1 there we are for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. Now, as we've seen in the past couple of weeks, as we've been through other parables, the parables of Jesus are quite gripping, especially the story-like ones. They reveal something amazing sometimes or something convicting. They often evoke a response. So let me start out by just asking, what do you think upon hearing this parable? Do you agree with the landowner and his actions and what he says? to the workers who come to complain to him? Do you think it's reasonable for the first workers to come and complain? In the days leading up to this Sunday, I told some friends and family that I was going to preach on this subject, on this parable today. And responses were mixed. Anonique was one, my girlfriend was one who said, I don't think it's quite fair, actually, what the landowner does here. She could see why the early workers came up to him and complained. And I can understand why. I mean, they did work longer in the vineyard that day. It was a hard day, a hot day, hard work. So maybe they are right to complain. What do you think? Then again, I've always loved this parable and found it quite amusing precisely because while I can see where those workers are coming from with their complaint, they have zero chance at winning this argument with the landowner. Because it is his wealth. It is his to share. If he wants to pay those people who worked only one hour uh, the full sum, then that's on him. So he's totally in the right. Have a look at this. Perhaps you've seen these mugs before. Um, some friends of mine got these as a gift for their wedding. Um, and they were kind enough to take a picture of it uh, for me for today. So the groom gets a mug with Mr. Right on it, and the bride gets a mug with Mrs. Always Right on it. It's um, a little joke on relational dynamics, I suppose. Now, being in a relationship myself, I can say that I have absolutely no idea whatsoever what this... Um, that maybe I do. Um, <laughs> but jokes aside... Um, this is one way we could look at this parable. 
It is one thing I find amusing about it, seeing how one is right for a bit, but the other is more in the right. It's almost like a legal battle, and me being a former lawyer, I kind of enjoy the cleverness of the landowner. But perhaps it's not the best way to look at this parable as a matter of who's right and who's wrong. So to find out more, let's try and see what prompted Jesus to tell this parable at the time. What was the message it tried to convey for the people present then? And from there, we can begin to discover a bit about what it could mean for us today. So what prompted Jesus to tell this parable? Well, as you probably know, some of the parables of Jesus are direct answers to questions asked by someone in the crowd. This is the case, for example, with the um, famous parable of the Good Samaritan, the one Becky spoke on a few weeks ago. Jesus launched into that parable because someone in the crowd, a lawyer, by the way, asked, who is my neighbor? And Jesus told the story. Also with this parable, it's an answer to a question, or rather, it's part of a longer answer to a question asked a little before this chapter. And the biggest clue for that we find in verse 16 of Matthew 20, the final words of this parable, where Jesus concludes, so the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is a phrase that Jesus has mentioned before. So you could say that the parable kind of elaborates on that thought. And in fact, it was answering a question asked by the Apostle Peter. So we'll go back a bit to Matthew 19. And just real quick, this is where Jesus introduces the idea of the last will be first and the first will be last. He has just encountered a rich young ruler, a wealthy guy who wanted to know how he could attain eternal life. And Jesus first mentions about the, com the commandments given by God, but our guy is quite confident about himself and says, I've done that. I kept the commandments of God and I've done so all my life. But when Jesus says, then sell all your stuff, come back and follow me, the guy goes away sad because he had lots of stuff. As Jesus watches him go, he says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And that statement shocks a lot of the people standing by. But the apostle Peter, then the disciple Peter, asks a follow-up question. What then will we have? It's not a bad question, actually because the rich young ruler, he had a lot of stuff, but the disciples had left most everything behind to follow Jesus. Peter had left his boat and nets at the lake. The disciples, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, whom Jesus called the sons of thunder, they left their father standing right there. They left the family business behind and they went and followed Jesus. Jesus said it is Difficult, if not impossible, for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven, except for God's doing. But what about the disciples, who had close to nothing, except their walk with Jesus? Well, Jesus answers that those who abandon their things and their families, even their families, to follow him, for his name's sake, they will receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But, Jesus says, many who are first will be last, and the last first. And the parable that he then tells elaborates on this statement. So let's look at the parable again. Telling this parable is a bit like telling a funny story. It has an unexpected twist, it has a, a point where things start going differently than you might expect. And it even has some sort of a punchline, if you will. Now, the typical workday in a vineyard is about 12 hours, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. That's a long day and it's heavy work. 
A denarius was the usual wage for a full day's work. So it's quite common that those guys who are hired early get a full denarius and they agree with it, with the landlord. And it's also quite probable that those hired later in the day will not get the full daily wage. The owner of the vineyard goes out at uh, the third hour, which is about nine o'clock, and he hires new workers and sends them into the vineyard. He says to them, whatever is right, I will give to you, and they go. But they're fully expecting not to receive the full daily wage because they're not putting in a full day of work. They're working about three quarters of a work day, so they're probably expecting to get about three quarters of the usual daily wage. And those in the crowd listening to Jesus telling this story are probably making the same calculations. And then there's another group of workers hired at noon, some at 3 p.m. And finally, a group of workers hired at 5 p.m. That's one hour before the workday ends. Now, surely the landowner will pay them all according to the hours of work they put in that day, right? For sure. But that's when things take an unexpected turn. The landowner has everyone lined up at the end of the day and sends his manager to pay everyone up, instructing him to start at the end of the line and make his way back to the start of the line. Now, the last workers of the day, they get the full daily wage, probably to their own surprise. And again, probably to the surprise of those standing by and listening to Jesus telling this story. And at this point, reading or hearing this story, you've all but forgotten the agreement between the first workers of the day and the owner of the vineyard. I imagine that those workers themselves, they have it somewhere at the far back of their minds. They have a full day of work behind them, and it was a hot day. And who are those guys at the other end of the line anyway, they might say to one another. I haven't seen any of them most of the day. And look, they are getting a full daily wage, a full denarius. Well, if they get the full daily wage, then surely we are going to get some more, right? We'll start from there. We'll start from the daily wage and our reward should be stacked upon that. But then the manager gets to them. And as it turns out, they too get the full daily wage, the one denarius. And what seemed a very fair and common and reasonable price in the morning suddenly doesn't seem so fair anymore. They start grumbling and complaining to the landowner. And like we said at the start, that may not be entirely without reason or unwarranted. But the landowner isn't having any of it. And then comes the punchline. But sir, you are paying those guys who worked only one hour the same amount as you're paying us. And the landowner says, do you begrudge my generosity? Put differently, are you annoyed or jealous that I am good? Ouch. The story ends there. And Jesus comes full circle. So. In this way, the last will be first, and the first last. That's some food for thought. It's an entertaining story. Did it land, though, with the disciples and the others present? Honestly, I'm not too optimistic. Just like with us, sometimes it took the disciples, on many occasions, several times to learn something and remember it. And if this parable points out that it doesn't always matter about being the first and the foremost, because there's no guarantee that if you come first, you will also get the biggest reward. Well, that lesson didn't stick with them. They didn't remember it very well. And to know that, all you need to do is just read a little further down chapter 20. Soon after this, Jesus is approached by the mother of James and John the son of thunder's mom, mother lightning, let's say. 
And basically she asks Jesus to promise that her two boys will get the loftiest seats in heaven. One sitting on the right side of Jesus, one sitting on the left side of Jesus. So all they have their minds on is getting the biggest reward. In response, Jesus has to remind them again that it's not so much about being the first and greatest. He puts it in strong and direct words. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave, which is a complete reversal of ideas about what it means to make it to the top back then and now. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Whoever wants to be first and foremost has to become the last and least. And again, it didn't really stick with them. This thing about who comes first and who is the greatest is a recurring dispute among the disciples. It was still with them and still an ongoing conflict even at the Last Supper. And all the while, Jesus is repeatedly telling them that he's on his way to Jerusalem to die. I think the disciples did learn this lesson in the end. And I think, though it took them a while, they learned it quite well. But I think we've spent quite some time now to think about what it meant for the people back then. So let's take some time to think about what this parable could mean for us now. There's probably several lessons we can learn from it. I'll bring up a few. No peek into heaven. I remember reading this parable once and imagining from it what it would be like in heaven. I think that was kind of initiated by the first phrase, like the kingdom of heaven is like. And my imagination started going and I was imagining this great throng of people, believers, young and old from every point in time um, in this big hall, this heavenly hall. And then one by one, they would be called forward to receive their reward, but they would start with the people at the far back. I thought of it as an outworking of this parable and it's a nice picture. But actually, I don't think this parable tells us a lot about what it's going to be like at the end of the age, because it's not meant to do that. Jesus is not trying to paint a picture of the end times, but he is making a strong point about the generosity of God. God is a generous God. I think many of us in this church believe that. And his generosity goes beyond what is expected. Let me discuss the implications of that on a few levels. Let's say for a moment that the workers in the vineyard, in the parable, are Christians and churchgoers, and that the landowner and his generosity is a picture of God and his generosity. Now, I'm quite sure there are people also in this church in Christ First who have been faithful members for years, longtime followers of Christ and faithful in their contribution to the church's work and ministry. Now, I've only been at Christ First for a short time, but I've been going to church for most of my life and I've participated or volunteered elsewhere. Now, like the early workers in this story, over time, thoughts may creep in that since we have been faithfully involved for so long, it's only natural that we would get a bigger reward in the end. I mean, we did bear the brunt of the work. It was difficult at times. So isn't it just reasonable that we get a bigger reward in this life or the next? There is more to be said about rewards and about degrees of rewards. We could talk about gathering treasures for yourself in heaven. I think that's a discussion for another time. What I would like to say now is that those thoughts can be dangerous too. Don't get me wrong. I think God rejoices at your faithful service, at your continuous attendance, especially in this challenging time. 
at seeing how long you have been faithfully following him, growing in your faith. But the heavens also rejoice and rejoice greatly at the one individual who has only just come in, made a mess of their lives at first, and now gives their life to Jesus. Everyone's first and primary reward is the gift of God's grace. Whether you've been brought up a Christian or become a Christian much later in life. And the gift of grace is God's gift to give. Just like what the landowner says, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? I'm sure we believe in this church that salvation belongs to the Lord and that it can only come from the name of Jesus, but that also means that it is the Lord's gift to give. And it's his choice whom he gives it to and when, even when we, seasoned and experienced Christians as we may be, are standing by and wondering about it. Even when we think, well, I'm not quite sure about that, God is fully in the right to say, well, I am. In this way, God may be more generous in extending his grace than we would expect. More than we would think is common or appropriate. And like those workers in the vineyard, even beyond what we think is fair. The amazing thing here is that God is not fair. He is just. He is not Mr. Right. He's not Mrs. Always Right. He is righteous and perfectly righteous at that. The owner of the vineyard said to those he hired later, go into the vineyard and I will give you what is right. And when the early workers come to complain, he says to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Maybe this is a good picture of it. Newer Christians and longtime Christians are all blessed with the lavish gift of God's grace. So to those who join in later, God gives what is right. And to us who have been in longer, he's doing us no wrong. Now, I love reading this parable, but I think it makes the most impact on me, convicts me the most, when I stumble upon it. Not really looking for it, but reading my Bible and coming across it. And that's precisely because it's an area where I tend to stumble. As I said, initially, grace is the gift of God. It is God's gift to mankind. But God also explicitly calls us in the Bible to be gracious with one another, to give grace to others. And that's where I tend to stumble. God is much more generous in this than I am. As an aside, I hope to be able to come back to the UK in a few weeks. I'm really excited about being with you in person again, actually. Um, and I, of course, I'm coming back to resume my studies. I'm studying theology with London School of Theology. I'm heading into my third year now. And I've been learning so much, and I'm looking forward to learn even more. But this parable is a good reminder that I don't have all the answers. I won't have all the answers. Surprise, surprise. And I shouldn't be too quick to make a judgment call. The generosity of God goes beyond mine. The generosity of God sometimes is beyond me. And it will break out of many of the boxes that I tried to put it in. One more thing about this generosity before we close. You may wonder, if the landowner was so generous, couldn't he just give the final workers the full daily wage 
and give the earlier workers some extra money? He wanted to be generous, right? And it was a hard day. It was a hot day. He could throw in some extra money, perhaps, to reward those early workers a bit more. Perhaps. But I think it's beside the point. Jesus is using this story as a striking way to make a point about the beyondness of God's generosity and to explain more about what it means for the last to be first and the first to be last. But the parable doesn't put a limitation on God's generosity either. Let's keep in mind what Jesus said in chapter 19. Those who leave behind most everything to follow him will receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Now, if that doesn't say enough about the generosity of God, I don't know what does. A life spent with him or more years of being a Christian give us all the more time to experience God's grace, to live in his presence and to receive his blessings. Whatever there is to be said about rewards in the age to come, in the life after this one, this is a great benefit of being a Christian for a longer time. Now, Jesus does not say when these hundredfold blessings will be poured out. And it may very well be that these blessings don't quite look like what we in the 21st century West would think of. To be sure, it is not a promise of wealth and riches. That would be a bit odd, considering that Jesus had just said it is very difficult for a rich person to get into heaven. So maybe those blessings are different. Maybe they look different than that. They could be in the miraculous, but they could be in the mundane. Maybe they look like being able to share a meal with friends, celebrate God's goodness. Some of us will be sharing a meal with Matt Boyru, whom we just prayed for uh, before he goes to Zimbabwe. And I think it's good for that to be a celebration of God's goodness um, and his call on Matt's life. Maybe it looks like being allowed to come together and worship um, as we've been thanking for in our prayer as well in a free country where we are free to do so. Maybe the blessings of God look like experiencing God's presence even in the toughest of times and in the day-to-day -day struggles, the more common struggles of life, when in between jobs perhaps, or when a certain virus gets in the way of lots of good things. If we start thinking about it that way, then we are being blessed hundredfold already. We can fully trust Jesus when he says that when we leave or are forced to leave behind family, goods, and things, that we will be blessed. And for all of us, when we live a life of faithfully following Jesus, the primary and greatest and initial blessing that is distributed to all will be to inherit eternal life with him. Let's rejoice in that. Amen.